Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. A uh, few less people here so far this morning, but um, where two or three are gathered, God is in their midst. And so we're going to pray together and, and commence our study. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have each morning to open your word. Um, we pray, Lord, for one another. We know that um, the forces of nature sometimes can hinder people being here. And uh, we pray for those that may be affected by the winds in um, Spokane and area and Washington and Oregon and wherever. And throughout the world, Lord, those that are suffering in various ways. We ask for your angels' care and protection um, for those that are searching for truth. And we just ask for your spirit to be here as we open your word together. Thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So this week we, we ran into a, I don't know, a stone wall maybe isn't quite uh, the way to look at it, but we ran into a, a problem that is when we started looking at uh, these verses here, uh, especially when we look at verse 18, um, we had problems with the, the application that Uriah Smith and pretty much everyone else has made of this verse. As people have drawn in an assumption um, that I think is is flawed. Now, um, most commentaries are going to apply these verses still to a Thai kiss epiphanies. Now, Swearingen, he's going to um, have a Thai kiss epiphanies earlier, uh, but he's still going to switch this over to Rome. So it's it's kind of odd how he does it. So at some point we switch to Rome. Um, and, and and we don't, well, I guess we don't have Antiochus Epiphanes, right? But then when we start to look at this, it introduces a subject which um, has really been through from chapter 10 is this idea of Michael, your prince. So that is what we're seeing here is the great controversy in action. Whenever you have Michael, he's in opposition to Satan, right? That's that's what it's it's basically a challenge. Who is like God or one who is like God? That's what the name Michael means. And um, so we had looked back in in verse 14 when it says Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. One of the things that that I had noted, uh, the robbers of my people shall exalt themselves, that obviously they're not doing it on their own mind to establish the vision. That this that this vision that's being talked about here, which is the chazon, right, is the this um, this desolation of these two desolating powers, pagan and papal Rome, right. So when when we looked back there, we could see that. What's being talked about here is not so much the intent of Rome, but the intent of God, right? So God has this prophecy, and Rome exalts itself, not so in its own mind that it can establish the vision, but so that prophecy can be fulfilled. Then when we dealt with um, um, Cleopatra, when it says, and he shall give him Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar representing the papacy in our time, but in, historically Julius Caesar, the daughter of women, Cleopatra, uh, causing her ruin, that's corrupting her, that the question was, well, who was the he? And, and I suggested that this is actually a reference back to God. God shall give this. And, and the reason that he does this is the same reason that Rome exalts itself to establish the vision. Now, this is quite a different view than anybody has ever had on these verses. Um, now, and, and then it does have an implication for how we, we apply it to our time as well. Then when we get to verse 18, um, when it talks about, you know, the, the occupation of Egypt. So we apply that in our time to conquering of atheistic communism by the papacy. He's going to turn his face unto the isles 
and, and we're just saying that this is uh, Rome basically uh, seeking to uh, overcome people's multitudes of nations, tongues, right? Um, that That is the world, right? It's going to conquer the world. So the originally the Isles refers to the Mediterranean Basin, but here it's going to re- refer to all of these multitudes of people. And shall take away many. So we paralleled that with um, Daniel 11. Uh, I think it's, I always forget which verse it is, but near the end there, where it, it, shall, it says, shall take many, it says, make away my, many. Right? So this is a type of captivity. And then it says, but a print, but a prince. Um, now the King James says, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause, uh, the repro- reproach offered by him to cease. Now, the offered by him and the for his own behalf, I don't see them as being in the text itself. So, so this is something where they're making an, an interpretation of the text in this translation. Um, so what it says, so what it really just says is, um, uh, he will cause to cease the prince, uh, the reproach. That's all it says. It just has those three words, nothing else, not all of this other stuff. And none of those are attached uh, to the verse itself, right? So, the, or to the words themselves, right? So there's nothing in um, the Hebrew in that verse that would give us this indication that we have this. So it's just going to say uh, Shabbat and to cease, and it's going to be, um, that's 7673. And then it says the prince or a prince doesn't have a definite article. And then it's, it's going to have, um, shame, right? The reproach 2781, which is July 18, uh, the 18th of July. 2020 backwards, right? So we go 1872, this is 2781. So it's backwards of that. So it's kind of interesting. It shows that there's something about that symbol that actually relates to reproach, okay, in some way, okay? Now, um, a person could argue, because there is another, uh, uh, after that word, uh, to him is, is, uh, that's just low, right? So it's kind of uncertain exactly. Different translators apply that word differently um, on on how it's how it's attached to the sentence, um, because then it's going to talk about um, uh, yeah. So this is, however, um, the reproach. Uh, sh- shall return upon him, right? So that's how it should be transit. So the reproach is going to uh, return upon him. And if we were to take that, if we were going to say that a prince, and if we put that as Michael, he's going to cause to cease, cease the reproach, but he's going to have the reproach return upon him, right? So we have, um, let me see if I can try to make this clear. I know it's tough if you don't read Hebrew, and I, I could show you the Hebrew, but it might not help you too much. So, so he doesn't have his own reproach, is the idea here, and he's going to cause the reproach to turn upon himself. Now, does this make sense when it comes to Christ? Is this what he does? Does he cause to, to cease the reproach? But since he doesn't have his own reproach, does he allow that reproach to turn upon himself? Is that what happens with, uh, with Christ? And, and we would have to say, well, yeah, you know, that, that makes, the most sense for this. But the question that we were asking is why is Christ introduced here? 
Well, he's not really introduced here because Michael, your prince, if we take chapter 10 and 11 and 12 as all one vision, it's going to start with this issue of the great controversy. That is, Daniel is having this vision, this explanation being given to him because he's not really seeing things. He's not describing what he's seeing. He's just being told about what's going to happen, right? He's going to see him in, in chapter 12. He's going to see some things, and he sees some things in chapter 10. But this is not something he's seen. So he's not actually seeing this. He's just being told this. This is Gabriel talking to him, right? And uh, so he talks to him about Michael in chapter 10, right? There's this great controversy. He's there. When Darius the Mede, you know, conquers Babylon, he's there. When Cyrus uh, gives this decree, and it's actually basically the day that that decree is issued, Cyrus's decree is issued, that he's given this information. So now that Cyrus has this battle between Christ and Satan over Cyrus's decision has been has been won. So Cyrus has made this decision to issue this decree and probably issues it at that time. So the uh, 24th, whatever it is, the, um, which is the date again. Because uh, he's going to fast three full weeks. So it's going to be, I always forget. I think it's the 24th day of the first month. <clears throat> Um, yeah, the 24th day of the first month. So in, you know, since he's in Persia and he's, uh, right, so that's going to be the date. So the 24th day of the first month is going to be, why is that not happening? Oh, that's why. Hang on. Do this wrong. Yeah, so this date is going to be, I'm just giving it to you, it's in 537. <clears throat> and it's going to be uh, the 24th day of the first month. So that's going to be, doesn't make sense, something, uh, I don't know what I've done here. Ah, 536, that's why. Okay, so it's 536. So because Cyrus comes to the throne in the fall of 537 and in the spring of 537, so on the 24th day of the first month, that's going to be April 23rd, 536. So that's that's when this vision is given. So Cyrus has just issued his decree that they're going to return. So there's this controversy. And now he starts to explain to him um, uh, in chapter 11. It's going to say, um, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. So the first year of Darius the Mede is going to be a reference back to the fall of Babylon, right? And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all, right? So that's when it's going to go into that explanation. But remember um, that... It, at the end of chapter 10, it says, um, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. There is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Right. So so the issue here is this is about Michael, the prince. Right. This is about Christ. And so when he starts to go through and explain what's happening with these kingdoms. This is. um really about prophecy. It's prophecies about Christ, right? About this interaction between Christ and Satan. So when we get to verse 18, then, you know, it's talking about Julius Caesar, what he's doing. So this is in this time of Rome prior to Augustus, because Christ is going to be born in the time of Caesar Augustus. But it says, um, you know, however, a prince for his own behalf. So, what, but it, it doesn't say that. It just says, shall cause to cease, a prince shall cause to cease, the reproach. But without his own reproach, he will cause this reproach 
to turn upon himself. Right? So, so this prince is taking the reproach upon him. And in so doing, he's causing the reproach to cease. Now, if we have, if this interpretation is correct, this is very interesting because, but it makes sense in the context. Right? That, that the prince here, a prince that's referred to, right? So it says a prince because it's talking about all of these things, but it says a prince, right? Not the prince, a prince. So it's introducing something new here to this narrative. And that prince would then be Christ. But the question is, why would Christ be introduced in this time of Julius Caesar when Julius Caesar is taking to conquer this whole area? So, so this is Julius Caesar. Now, Rome is, is conquering. It's creating this kingdom under Caesar. Now, Caesar wanted to be a king. He's, he even had a throne. He didn't have a crown, but he really would have liked to have a crown. Um, so why is it mentioned in this context? Why is it not mentioned later in the time of Augustus when Christ does come or in Tiberius? Because we're going to see, of course, uh, Augustus is going to be verse 20 and Tiberius is going to be verse 21. So why, why would that be? I know one of you doesn't have a mic and... Um, some of you don't generally talk during these studies. But is there a reason that it would be introduced here? So if we if we go back to this great controversy issue, uh, we have this Michael being there at the time when Babylon is falling, right? Babylon is falling. Michael is there. Um, when we have that transition that controversy is, is, is raging in the mind of Cyrus between Christ and Satan over this decision that he has to make. Would we say that there's something about this history that would uh, have Gabriel introduce Michael the Prince, his offering, his taking away of the reproach and bringing the reproach upon him, upon himself? Because he's going to cause it to turn upon himself. That's the idea I get from, from the Hebrew. And I, and I looked at this like all different commentaries and different Hebrew dictionaries looked at everything. And, and that to me is what, what's happening here. This is reflexive. So, um, this prince, he's going to cause the reproach to cease. He doesn't have his own reproach that is, he doesn't have any sins. He doesn't have any shame. But he's going to cause the reproach to turn upon, turn upon himself. That's how he causes the reproach to cease. And it's introduced at the time when there is this transition. This is when really Rome comes into this history. So I, I hope that makes sense. I mean, I don't like coming up with something that nobody's ever seen before. Because then, you know, you have to defend it and you have to say, well, is it correct? You know, maybe, maybe I'm just not understanding. But it, as Ron says, it makes sense to me. Well, it makes sense to me here in this context, but it's very different, right? Um, now it's going to have its implications then when we apply it to our history. Uh, we didn't, um, in this, in this here, we, we still were trying to finish off verse 17 because we were struggling with this. And again, there is things about this verse that it's it's interpreted in a specific way because of their belief that of, of who it's applying to. Right. So different people interpret these or translate these verses differently, depending on how they see this prophecy being fulfilled, which which isn't really. To me, it's not really honest, right? You should look at what the verse says and then try to figure out the interpretation. But often people start with the interpretation of the verse and that leads to how they're going to translate it, right? So I've just tried to look at, 
at what the verse actually says and then try to make sense out of it. So when we have, and he shall give him the daughter of women, well, people have different explanations for who the he is. Now it's either uh, Cleopatra's father um, or or something like that. There's there's different, different, and I don't fully understand this history. Some just ignore the fact that he shall give him, you know, they don't even address who the he is. But we would say, if this is God, if this is just God's providence uh, that's being referred to, uh, this, this makes more sense, right? So when it says, thus shall he do, uh, that word H6213, uh, this is, to me, indicating that God is going to do. God is appointed by his providence to give to Caesar Cleopatra. Now, he's done this because God understands the repeat of history. But also, um, this has to do with the fall, not just of Cleopatra, but also of Egypt. Right? And Egypt represents the world, right? So Cleopatra, as the queen of Egypt, she's she's going to be, and it's going to happen later. We're going to have the Battle of Actium, uh, in which you know Egypt really will be conquered by Rome. So, and and that's going to be all in connection with what happens with uh, Julius Caesar's when he has the Battle of. You know, the battle, the siege of Alexandria. Basically, he's kind of trapped in Alexandria. And Cleopatra is going to be snuck in uh, to where he is. And um, he's going to sort of settle these, all of these different issues when, um, I believe it's her father dies and, and so forth. So th- there's, there's a bunch of stuff that happens that I, I don't remember all the details. I, I get really confused with names. Um, especially when they're like the same names. So you got all these Ptolemies, um, you know, which one's which. Uh, so, and I'm sure other people do as well. But anyway, in this point, in God's providence, he's going to give to Julius Caesar the daughter of women. And this is a strange expression, right? This daughter of women. Why is it the daughter of woman, right? There, there has to be a reason why this expression is being used. And, and the idea is that it brings us back to uh, to the beginning where somebody is given in marriage. So this is a type of marriage that is, is happening between the papacy and the dragon power. But it's going to cause the ruin of the world. So this, this union between the papacy and wokeism, we could even use that term, is going to cause the fall of the world. Now it says, when she shall not stand, neither be for him. Now, on his side is not implied in the Hebrew in any way that I can see. So I just crossed it out, right? And, and I believe it's in italics, but, um, so I just crossed it out. We don't, we don't need it. Uh, but she shall not stand. That word stand, this has to do with a, a kingdom that's going to rise, right? So Egypt here is not going to rise. Rome is the one that actually stands. And and she's not going to be, that is, she's not going to exist for him, right? So there's nothing to do with Julius Caesar and Cleopatra not supporting him or anything like that. This is just the fact that that Cleopatra is not going to exist, right? She's not, Egypt, which Cleopatra represents, is not going to exist. It's going to fall, right? Now, then we see that this happens, and and after this, shall he, so that's still going to be Caesar, the papacy, shall turn his face unto the isles. So in our history, it's the papacy. In this history, it's Caesar. He's going to seek to conquer the world, right? All of these peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's the UN, right? So um, 
we're going to kind of be consistent with how we've done things. Um, this is going to be the UN, right? So that's what the papacy is, is conquering or turning his face towards. So he hasn't conquered it yet. Now, we could say this is the Mediterranean basin uh, his, historically. Um, um, I guess I probably should have. So that's, I probably could have done it this way. Just hang on. So we got that. And get rid of this. Okay. And he shall take many. So to me, this, this is a reference to, uh, a Daniel chapter 11. So people have comments on this. I know there's some comments in the chat here. Uh, yeah, those are just fine. Uh, so it's 44, 11 verse 44. The tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and make away many. And, and to me, that is going to be um, a parallel. Right? So we put it this way. This is a parallel. So Cleopatra is a representative of the Roman Catholic Church, right? No. No. No, she's... she's She's representing Egypt. Okay. Dragon power, right? Right. So that would be a church of paganism, right? Well, yeah. So it's the spiritual aspect of wokeism, right? Okay. Not so much the political aspect. She okay. represents, she represents, yeah. So a woman represents a church. In this case, you know, you could say it represents the new age, atheism, wokeism, you know, Gaia, whatever, you know, there's all of these different, um, uh, I can't think of the word, but all, all of these different, uh, philosophies that secular philosophies, you know, astro, astro, astrology, you know, reading tarot cards, all, all of that stuff, all of that mysticism. That's what Egypt represents, right? In this context. So so Rome is representing the papacy here. In this in this application. Remember we had we had the, the you know the end of 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 Greece, you know, Rome exalted itself. But now here, this is the papacy, you know, first prior to nineteen eighty nine and then afterwards. And so we're in this time after nine eleven here in this context. Right. Which which I think, you know, we're going to start to see how we're interpreting this historically and how we then apply it to our history draws us into our history. Now, um, so there there's a lot that happens here that we're going and then we're going to have the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome uh, being illustrated in this history as well. Right. So um, so we'll see how that fits in. And, and I only have some sketchy ideas, but I can already sort of see ahead as we've gone through this to sort of see where we're going to get to, right? Because um, one of the things we saw when we looked at, you know, Persia is we saw, you know, the presidents of the United States, same when we looked at Greece. And now we're going to have that same thing happen when we apply it, these, these next verses to our history. It's going to be talking about what's happening in that period from 1989 to the Sunday law. And it's going to deal with these presidents, which we've already understood about these verses, right? So this is not something new, but we have now put this in a little bit different or maybe not different, but a clearer context within our lives than we had in the past. So this making away many, um, but it's one one other question, Theodore. Yeah. You got Caesar being the papacy, right? Yeah, because Rome is the papacy, and Caesar is <clears throat> he's he's sort of see Caesar is making himself a king. Right. And this history, I mean, he's going to get a golden throne, and you know his name does mean a king, 
right? That's right. what the means. And, you know, he had somebody at one of these uh, assemblies or whatever, um, are you a king or a Caesar or something like that? And and he says, uh, not a king, but Caesar or something like that. I can't remember how it goes, but it was, there's a pun there dealing with king and Caesar because it's the same word. And, um, uh, and, and, and it sort of insulted everyone. And, and he had actually planted this person to to say this, according to uh, historians. So so Caesar wanted to be a king, right? And and the papacy wants to be a king. It wants to rule the world. So so what Caesar is doing parallels what the papacy is doing in our time. So that that's simply what it is. Okay. So now we have introduced Christ, and, and we can see then why Christ is introduced here. Because we have this person who wants to be a king, Caesar, but who is the king of kings and lord of lords? Christ, right? And he's, he's going to be illustrated in contrast to Caesar, right? That is, Christ is in contrast to the papal spirit. And that's why I think he's introduced here. It, it's a contrast of characters between Caesar's aspirations and what Christ is doing, what Michael, your prince, is doing. And this, to me, makes perfect sense. <clears throat> um, so this reproach offered by him to cease, or this reproach to cease, right? So we're going to say that this is is introducing Christ or the cross. So without his own approach, so Christ has no shame of his own, he shall cause to turn upon him. So this is not about Caesar, to defend Caesar against the Romans. He will cause to turn upon himself, right? So I'm going to put here, upon himself um, so so this is a reference to the cross so that's that's what happens there. so that's verse 18 so then when it says then he Caesar shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land that is going to be Caesar right so you know if we look at this I'm going to just break this up differently because I think the idea If I go back here, I'll just do it this way. This, just put this all into one section. So then this is going to be verse 19. Look for this. Just quotation marks. Sorry about that. So I'm just adding verse 19 to this section, just because that's where I think the division should be. Okay, so th this now makes sense, this section. Right. What, what's being contrasted? You have the papacy being contrasted or, or Rome being contrasted to Christ. Right. That makes sense. This, to me, this makes so much more sense than how we were looking at these verses before, especially since the Hebrew doesn't support the translation. So you see everything that 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 Rome is doing. You know, it's seeking to take over this whole area to create this empire. Caesar himself seeking to be a king. But you have Christ. He doesn't have any reproach, but he's going to cause the reproach to cease by taking it upon himself. So quite a different attitude than Caesar. Okay. So I hope people are happy with that. Now, we still have to make applications to our time here, to the present situation. But I don't know if, if you know, um, other than in a sort of a general sense that we could see this, unless there is something else here symbolically. Now, one of the things that I want to point out is this word to cease. 
So this word to cease, we talked about it yesterday, 7673. Now, 7670 is, um, so this, this word is related to the word Sabbath. So I will go here. Okay. So I'm going to do it this way. So you can see the word. It's Shabbat. Okay. 7673. Now, if you look at 7676, that's the word all Shabbat. The difference between these is just a dot in the middle of the bet. So that, that middle letter there, it's a bet or the B sound. This is a sh, that's a shin. So shab. And then if it has a dot in the center, that means you double the B in, in your pronounce shabbat, right? It's still going to sound the same shabbat, but it's, it's pointed differently than 7673, right? So you can see it doesn't have the dot there and it just only has one B. Now, this comes from this word. Um, pardon me. No, it doesn't come from this one. Where does it come from? Uh, not Shabbat. Shabbat. No. So I guess this is actually the root. Shabbat 7673. Now, uh, 7670, that's what it is. So if I had 76, Seven zero. I'll show you here. This is just as a as a number, and I divided this by twenty one. You'd see that I get a number very close to uh, the length of a year. That's three hundred and sixty five point uh, two three eight. So you'd say two four if you rounded it up. Which is, you know, close to two five. So, so this period, seven six seven zero would be 21 years. So that means seven six seven three is 21 years and three days. And, and the question is, is there some period of time that we have in our lines that is 21 years and three days? And I can't think of any right now. So, so that would be something that we would, we would have to look at where, where this 21 years and three days comes from or how we would apply that. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind as a symbol. Now we know there's the 21 days in Daniel chapter 10 and you could apply a day for a year, but then the question is why the three days? And, and since we've dealt with the three days before, as a symbol that maybe that's the significance of it is it is pointing uh, to the three days of, of the cross. So the 21 years representing well, seven times three, right? Seven or three weeks, right? That's three full weeks that Daniel is going to be fasting. So, so I don't know. It's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay. Now, the other thing we looked at is this, this word turn. Now, there is actually in, in Daniel eleven eighteen. there's other manuscripts. Uh, they call them the Kof and the Kof. There's two different readings. And, and there is another reading instead of turn. But in looking it up, that, that reading was what, what ends up happening is they uh, misread one of the letters you know, in one of these manuscripts that changes the definition of the word. But this makes the most sense. The other one doesn't make any sense. And then you're going to see, well, in verse 19, it says he's going to turn his face and then he's going to turn his face again. And there isn't a separate reading in verse 19. So, so he's going to turn his face onto the aisles, right? But then we have Christ introduced here, the cross, him taking the reproach upon himself. And then in 11 verse 19, he shall turn his face towards the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. And then shall stand up in his estate, a raiser of taxes. So we recognize this as Caesar Augustus, okay? In the glory of his kingdom, right? But within a few days, he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate, so we're going to look up this word estate um, and what that would mean. 
shall stand up a vile person. So this is going to be Tiberius, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and he shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. So this is going to refer to Christ's, um, I was going to use a different word for prince here, Magid, but um, this prince of the covenant, the Berit, right? This is definitely a reference to Christ. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So we're going to have that league in 158. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Now, now the question is, why do they mention the league here? And, and, and what the way that I understand this is when we get here to this league, we actually go back a bit. We'll see why that is. Because this is going to bring us up to the cross, right? Up to verse 22. So I'm kind of showing you how I think this is structured. Now, what does, when we get to this league, what does uh, Miller do with this league? What is this next section from 23 up to, you know, whatever, wherever you can, I guess, to the end of the chapter? What is that section going to be addressing? Wouldn't that be the league between the Jews and the Romans? Yeah, okay. So, but so Miller takes that and he connects that league to the end of pagan Rome, right? So he's going to take 666 years and he's going to say, well, there's this league in 158. We count 666 years, which would end up being an inclusive count because he didn't take into account no zero year, but brings us to 508, right? And that's going to give him the starting point uh, for the 1290 and the 1335, right? So, so I, I'm saying that when we study Daniel chapter 11 and we get up to verse 22, we're finished that section. Whatever's being discussed there is, is accomplished, right? Because this is bringing us up to the cross, to it actually being acted out. We get to Julius Caesar. We have the cross introduced, right? Uh, then it's going to talk about, uh, what Julius Caesar's going uh, to do and and that's going to end in his end right he's going to be killed and then you're going to have Caesar uh, Augustus and then you're going to have Tiberius right and in the time of Tiberius you're going to have Christ being crucified well I was wrong about the league then it ain't it ain't got nothing to do with when the G- G- Romans no, it does. That's what I'm saying is now it's going to go back. Oh, okay. So, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where I went. Where, <laughs> I didn't know whether, whether or not I was right or not. That's what you know. So now we're going to go back. We're going to go back. So this brings us up to the cross, right? It brings us up to 31 AD to the Prince of the Covenant. So basically the Covenant week. So it brings us up to 34. But then we go back. So we go back now to this league. So it's going to deal with Rome in this not so much, you know, the Caesars and so forth, but just Rome as a power, right? So it's it's going to go back and, and reiterate some of this history because it's going to address the end of pagan Rome. And the end of pagan Rome begins with this league, right? The 666 years. Now, we know there's three periods of 666 years. So we have a period of 666 years that um, that actually connects uh, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, the siege of, of Jerusalem, where Jehoiachin is taken captive the 666 years prior to uh, the siege in 70 AD, where the temple is destroyed. And and so we've gone through that. Then there's two other periods of 666 years, one um, from 158 and one from 129 or sometimes 128. Depends on how you see it. When you have Judean independence, 
And that one, the second, the, so the one that Miller had, the only one he had was 158 to 538, but there is one from 129, or pardon me, his was to 508. There is from 129 to 538. So there's these three periods of 666 years. But here is introduced this first period. This is the period, uh, and when, when we go through this, it's going to bring us to the taking away of the daily. So we count from this Lee in 158 to the taking away of the daily before that's going to be verse 31. So these verses here are addressing that history. Right. So in here, when they shall take away the daily and shall place the abomination of make it desolate, the taking of the daily, the taking away of the daily, the, 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 the time. Uh, let me see, uh, let me see the daily, where is it? Setting up, that's going to be this one, placing. That's Natan, the taking away is the Sir. Okay, so you have Sir and Natan in contrast to each other. Um, and that's going to be 538. So you have 508 and 538 both mentioned here in verse 31. But that's what these verses are covering. Okay, so we're going to look, I'm just looking ahead of how I believe that this is structured. And any comments on that? So this is something that Adventists do. That is, those who take Atticus Epiphanes as being the fulfillment of those prophecies dealing with uh, the Prince of the Covenant and so forth, that this is talking about Atticus Epiphanes and the defiling of the temple, they have this going in this continuous chronological order, right? So they're going to put the leak here in 161. Um, and that's going to be right after Atticus Epiphanes, right? So you can see why they do that, right? There, there is a logic to it. So the Prince of the Covenant's not going to be Christ in that interpretation. And and this, um, so, you know, they're going to have Atticus Epiphanes here. Uh, different people do it differently, though. And, and And so there isn't a lot of consistency, even though it seems logical, and it's not as consistent as it, as our understanding is, right? So, so when we get to verse um, uh, 22, right, this is going to be referring back to 158. So any comments about that? So we're going to finish off these verses here, and then we'll get back to 158 and why that, why that transition happens there in that way. Dwight, does this make sense to you? I'm listening. I missed a good bit of this today because of internet connectivity issues. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what we did establish is that this idea that this prince that takes this reproach upon himself is Christ. Okay. okay. And then what we're, we're showing is there's this foreshadowing of what's going to happen in uh, verse um, 2022, right, with the crucifixion of Christ. Okay. But it's introduced here at the time when Rome is seeking to become this world power, that it, it's wanting to con, con, uh, you know, take over this whole area, the, all of the Mediterranean, which to them is really the world, right? All right. Okay. So it's at that time that this prince, who is Michael, is it's referring to now that Michael is basically the one who is, who is Christ. So now when he shall turn the, his face towards the fort of his own land. So this is when Caesar goes back to Rome, right? And he's going to be assassinated. So that's what verse 19 is going to address. So we can see that in, uh, you know, he's going to turn his face towards the Isles. We got that shuv, 7725. But Christ, in contrast, is he's going to uh, take this reproach and put place it upon himself, turn it upon himself, right? So this is the difference between Caesar and Christ. Caesar is seeking to exalt himself. He's the mind of Satan, Right. And, you know, we went through, you know, this great controversy with, you know, the fall of Babylon, and then you have Maria Persia, and then you have Greece, 
you always have in these people exalting themselves, right? That is, they're magnifying themselves. And, and Caesar's no different, but Christ is completely different. So, so once they introduce that, the fall of Caesar, his, his assassination, and we started looking at, you know, the triumvirate and things like that. Now, the Bible doesn't mention anything about that, the triumvirate, right? It just, it's just going to jump right into then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes. Now, uh, this word estate um, is is the word ken, and um, we got uh, here just these different definitions for it. So base, office, place, pedestal, office, foot, base, stand, pedestal, office, foot, place, estate. So, um, and it's the same as 3651, cane or can properly set up right, right? So that's what it means to set up right. So, so in his estate, there's going to be a raiser of taxes. So that is in the place that, that Julius Caesar had his kingdom. And because really he's, he wanted to be a king. We now have the first emperor, right? So we're going to have the first king, which is going to be Caesar Augustus. And he's going to be called a raiser of taxes. Now, you know, there's some disagreement over how to translate this. Um, but this is, this is how we've understood it. That this is Augustus. Um, and the honor of his kingdom. So his rule. So, so why does, Caesar Augustus, what is this thing about taxation? Why is this important? That we're going to have Caesar Augustus, he's going to want to tax the world, right? Isn't it more about control? Okay, control, yes. Because this is the glory or the honor of his kingdom. That That's why he, he stands up in his state, a raiser of taxes, in the glory of the kingdom. Glory is just the honor of the kingdom. But within a few days, which is kind of interesting, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Right. So how does this apply to Caesar Augustus? So we'll, we'll read what Uriah Smith says. So Octavius succeeded his uncle Julius, by whom he had been adopted. He publicly announced his adoption by his uncle and took his name. He joined Mark Antony and Lepidus to avenge the death of Julius Caesar. The three formed what is called the triumvirate form of government. After Octavius was firmly established in the empire, the Senate conferred upon him the title Augustus. And the other members of the triumvirate, now being dead, he became supreme ruler. So he's going to be the first emperor, right? He was emphatically a raiser of taxes. Luke, speaking of events that took place at the time Christ was born, says... It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Luke 2 verse 1. The taxing which embraced all the world was an event worthy of notice for the person who enforced it is certainly a claim above every other competitor to the title of a raiser of taxes. During the reign of Augustus, fresh taxation was imposed, one quarter of the annual income from all citizens, and a capital levy of one-eighth on all freemen. Um, okay. So, I mean, we're familiar with this idea. Now, this, this taxation, um, first there's a census that has to be done, right? So we know that the reason that, uh, Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem is it had to do with the census connected with the taxation, right? So, um, and it, and it's not as clear cut as far as like trying to read about this history exactly how this taxation worked. There's lots of different opinions, but, but we know that this, this is referring to Caesar Augustus. He's the one who's the raiser of taxes. And now how does Caesar Augustus die? So, so he stood up in the glory of his kingdom. Rome reached the pinnacle of its greatness and power during the Augustan age. The empire never saw a brighter hour. 
Peace was promoted, justice maintained, luxury curbed, discipline established, and learning encouraged. During his reign, the Temple of Janus was shut three times, signifying that all the world was at peace. Since the founding of the Roman Empire, this temple had been closed but twice previously. At this auspicious hour, our Lord was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in a little less than 18 years after the taxing brought to view, seeming but a few days to distant gaze of the prophet. Augustus died in AD 14, in the 76th year of his age. His life ended not in anger and battle, but peaceably, peacefully in his bed at Nola, whither he had gone to seek repose and health. Okay. So he's just going to die of old age or whatever, maybe he had a heart attack or something, but he's just going to die peacefully in bed. So there's no doubt that this has to refer to Caesar Augustus. Okay. Any questions about this? Not right now. Now we have these, these numbers. So, um, and, and you know, we've been looking at them. And it says within a few days. Uh, and and so, you know, we could look at this, these numbers. So days 3117. So one of the things about 117 is it rep represents July 18th and it's attached to the symbol of three. But if we added these a few days together, 3117 plus 259. So those are the Hebrew numbers that we're given. Um, we get a period that's about nine years and hundred no and nine years and eighty nine or eighty eight days. So eighty eight point seven five days. And that might fit in somewhere, like in our time. So right now we know that this is Caesar Augustus. And I, I just brought up this symbol. So how are we going to apply this to our time? So we know where, where do we put, who Caesar Augustus represent? How have we done this in the past? So Caesar Augustus represents the president of the United States. Which president? So was it so not? Caesar, yeah, okay, go on. Was it not being said that Augustus was supposed to represent Obama? Right. So, so now we, we have to look at these interpretations of how we're, understanding this. So I'm just going to put in what we've understood in the past, that this is Obama. So we're now going to line these up with these presidents of the United States, because this is what Jeff had done, right? So Caesar represents Obama as a raiser of taxes. Okay, now... Okay, but no, now wait a minute. The portion where you're putting Obama... Oh, pardon me, that's the wrong spot. Never mind. Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to go here to Augustus. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I know. I wasn't. Uh, okay. There. So, in other words, what you would have the estate raiser of taxes where you're going Caesar Augustus equaling Obama. In right. Two Caesar Augustus. Yeah. So we have Julius Caesar. He represents the papacy, right? That's how we've done this. So, this here, so. So we would still say that this is the papacy. But would we say that the, that the papacy is going to stumble at this point in, in current history? Yeah, that's what we have to decide. So right now we're just working through this. Okay. So we, we would have to try to say, well, how would that be the case? Now, when we look at, at Julius Caesar as, as the papacy, um, in this history, we have to decide how we're going to apply it. Now, we could apply it to John Paul II, right? Because through this history, uh, we just put in the papacy. But we know that it's there's going to be Pope John Paul, but then it's going to switch to these other popes. And so we would have to decide, is this just the papacy in a general sense, or is it referring to a specific pope in our history? Because then we have to apply when this is so and and the question is could caesar augustus be in the estate of the papacy right so that's that's where we're having this problem so but i'm just saying that that's how we have done that and now we have augustus he's going to be obama can we do this or do we have to interpret 
Julius Caesar as representing something else in our present time, right? Because this is literally going to be about Julius Caesar, right? But but how would we apply this? That That's the question. So you're asking the right question. What is this stumbling and falling of Julius Caesar's? How would that apply to us? Now, it could be that once you get to Julius Caesar, this, this, this would refer to the papacy ending, right, in the end. But then when you get to Augustus, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be addressing the presidents of the United States. Or maybe not, right? So, but this, we're, so we're looking at how we've been interpreting this and how Jeff then interpreted Augustus. Now, now did Jeff, what did Jeff do with Julius Caesar in this section? Like he's going to have Augustus. But does Julius Caesar, who's before Obama? Bush the second. Yeah. Does Bush the second fit with Julius Caesar? And I, I can't see him fitting, right? Well, okay. But you, here, here's the thing. Bush the second stood up internationally against Islam. Yeah. Obama did not stand up against Islam. So when he came in as president, he was trying to make peace throughout with all the Islamic states. Now, what we're looking at with this, then he, the papacy, shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but shall stumble and fall and not be found. Now, here we're, we're attempting to apply this against Caesar's assassination on the Ides of March. Does this fit? with John Paul II and Benedict. Yeah, see, and, and that's what I'm trying to, is because either this is John Paul II, or it's actually just the papacy in general, talking about its ultimate end. Right? Well, okay, but see, that's the conservative portion of the papacy. John Paul II and Benedict were very much conservatives, Francis is not a conservative. Yeah, I know. So, did they stumble and fall and not be found? I mean, for the longest time, Benedict was Pope Emeritus and was not in the public eye. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, the question is, could we align that with Caesar's assassination? I mean, is that is that the the proper way for us to do it? I don't know, but it's a good question. It's kind of the question that we're we're, we're trying to figure out here. It's how how would we look at this? Um, it's just that we've had you know Julius Caesar representing the papacy in just a general sense, right? Not a specific pope. And then we would have to say, well, what does it mean that he's going to turn his face toward the fort of his own land? I mean, we know what that means for for Julius Caesar, right? He's going to go back to Rome, and and there he's going to be assassinated. Uh, But what would this mean as far as the papacy in our time? How does it turn its face towards the fort of its own land? Now, so one of the problems I have here is, you know, we put the fort of his own land, that's H776, and we say it's Rome. Now, the word land, we can see that it's, it's you know, it's got this number that's close to 777. And we know that from, that the Soviet Union, from November 9th to December 25th, is 
776 days. It's only 777 inclusive days. In our line, the 777 from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021 is 777 days, right? So I look at this 776 and I say, well, it somehow usually refers to that period of time of the Soviet Union that it falls. <coughs> um, so, so we have to figure this out. So Julius Caesar's going to be assassinated. And, and he represents, we've had the, him representing the papacy in our lives. And the question is, here, does he represent the papacy or something else? Because at this time, Julius Caesar, I mean, he becomes king and he, and he represents this spirit of the papacy. Um, but what specifically would he be representing in turning his face toward the fort of his own land? Before we can even look at what does it mean that he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Right. So if the papacy is turning his face toward the fort of his own land. How would we, how would we see this in our time? So if, if we look at, we already know face is Panim, uh, that's Shuv, right? So it's just going to be simply, um, in the Hebrew, um, I'm just looking at the forms here and Yeshuv, right? So that's just, he shall turn. Or return, uh, Panin, right? So that's face, and two, uh, um, well, it's got a lamet in front of it, so that just means that's the two or against uh, Matsus, 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 how do you pronounce that? Uh, Ma Matsus. Matsui, Matsuzi, it's actually, so that means his, his fort. So, um, he's going to return or turn his face to his fort, and then it has, um, audits and it has a vav at the end. So that's his land, his own land. Right. So it's what it says. He's just going to turn his face towards the fort of his own land. Now, this word fort um, means a place or means of safety, protection, refuge, or stronghold, right? So it can be either human protection or uh, God protection used in a figurative sense. So the human protection or the refuge of God. But he's going to return to the fort of his own land. Now, it, it comes from a word which means to be stout, hardened, impudent, right? So that's just the, the basic root of it from 5810. But this is 4581. Okay, so how could the papacy do this? How, if, if, it's, if it's fulfilled this, how did it fulfill it? And, and see, we have to remember this, this narrative, the way that we're looking at this narrative here and how we're interpreting this. Um, so this is going to, when he turns his face onto the isles to take away many, we're, we're connecting this to Daniel chapter 11, verse 44, right? This is basically a precursor to this Sunday law. So the Sunday law is, is here in that history. This is the history of the image of the beast, right? But it, it shows here in contrast to this, the cross of Christ. But, but, the, but Michael, your prince is going to cause the reproach to cease by taking that reproach upon himself, turning it upon himself. But then we see he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land. We're applying that to, you know, Julius Caesar, right? He's going to stumble and fall, not be found. He's going to be assassinated. Okay. 
So, so it's in this context. And so when, if we're going to apply it to our time, when would this occur that he turns his face toward the fort of his own land if this is the papacy? And what would that really mean? It's some kind of protection. So he's looking for a refuge in his own land. How would we understand this? Can we make an application of this to the papacy in our time somewhere? Now, if you applied this to Pope John Paul II, I mean, Pope John Paul II basically just settles in the Vatican and then he eventually dies, right? But I don't know if it follows, verse 20 follows that. Then she'll stand up in his estate, the raises of taxes, Obama. And why in his estate? So hopefully people see the problem that we're running into. We have to understand this in some way that makes sense. Any ideas? Now, we could apply it to Benedict, maybe, too. I don't know. So nobody has any ideas? Now, uh, with Pope Benedict, uh, the period of time in which he um, is Pope is from April 19th, 2005. So, and, and how do they count the Pope? So, so I guess they have to have that vote and everything, right? So you're going to have, uh, he's going to, uh, Pope John Paul II is going to die on April 2nd. And then 17 days later, uh, Pope Benedict becomes Pope 2005. And so it's a period of, of seven years and, you know, 200 and some days. In those situations, you have cardinals that meet after the death of a pope or the resignation of a pope. Yeah. They go through an election process. And whatever time it takes, it takes. Yeah. However long. So, yeah, so it's so he's going to be Pope Benedict is going to be Pope for seven years, 314 days. Um, uh, well, you could be 315, depends how you want to count. Now, that period of time between April 19th, so that's not counting April 19th and February 28th, 2013 is um, a period of. 2,871 days. So it would be just a cardinal count of 2,872. But the time between those dates, 2,871, we have all those digits of July 18, 2020, right? It's kind of interesting. Right. Okay. And <clears throat> um, so we had a another number so where was this so, so i i have a question for you yeah what yeah what is the hebrew number 2871 what does it mean okay um well 2781 was reproach 2871 uh, is yeah 2781 is reproach right but but uh, 2871 uh, is turban. Or dyed attire, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, let me see here. This is slow. Yeah, so properly dyed, that's the word. That is a turban, turban properly of co colored stuff, but dyed attire, right? And, and this form is just the passive participle, participle of, uh, tabul, right? And in the Greek, it's what? Cutting or slaughter, carnage. But usually I use the Hebrew one when I'm dealing with the Hebrew text, but. Um, I guess I'm asking the question that 
Uh, is it possible that those that we've been looking at in the Hebrew are giving us pointers toward the historical situation and those in the Greeks are giving us pointers toward our situation currently? It's possible. Never thought of it that way, but... Okay. Okay, so... But this is making sense. I mean, we're, we're, we're getting somewhere with this. Um, right. So I, I would say that, um, you know, there, there's something about these popes that must be understood here. Now, uh, this fort of his own land. So you got uh, four or five. So I think what we could look at here is is something to do with the papacy, with the popes, their length of their reigns, because uh, if we could have some symbols that could tie to that, uh, that would be interesting. Uh, this verse itself, um, you know, it has the symbols of 9-11 in it. You know, it's 11-19. Um, so there is something to be said about that. Um, the whole verse itself, if we look at the lexical sum, is 37091. So that's a pretty long period of time. And if we put it into time, it's going to be like 101 and a half years. So I, I tried doing something with that. So 101 years and 200 or 201 days. And you, so I don't know what that would mean. You know, as far as maybe there's some key to that lexical sum. It's the 22,056th verse, which is a period of 60 years and 141 days. Any any final thoughts on this? I'm just looking at one other thing. A uh, little thing I noticed here. If you go to um, Daniel 12, verse 1. Um, at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. That verse is going to be the uh, 22,083rd verse in the Bible. Now, we're going to have our camp meeting that we had because we were talking about the camp meeting. Um, I'm going to go here. Right, so that's when our camp meeting began, the 24th of July, right? So we had dealt with some of those numbers. Now, if I count back from that date, 22,085, Oops, did I do that right? Now that goes to two days before I'm born. So that'd be 22,000. So it's the one, it's actually, if you go to the last verse, Daniel 11, verse 45. I don't know. It's just something to look at these spans of time. Okay. So let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and pray that you can bless each person in their time today. Thank you uh, for helping us to see Christ in this prophecy and we pray that he can be in our lives. Help us to follow and serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.